it's a really cool process and one of the and one of the most I think it's one of the most interesting bits of coccolith biology and people who aren't coccolith experts is something which is worth learning about it's a very interesting bioanalyzation process but it also as well as being a really interesting process it's an important one for anyone who who wants to understand and work with coccoliths because it is critical to understanding their morphology how, how they appear and also it's a key to understand their taxonomy so it's a it, if you're working on coccoliths it's really an aspect is worth learning as well um in this talk obviously it's going to be a, a fairly swift run through the main aspects uh there's quite a lot of there are some references as well which will, which will be in the talk online on the version you can see online and in the powerpoint online and it's if you're especially working on it it's worth going in and reading some of those references but basically they will go through so the overall structure so first of all the vr model which is the basic form of coccolith structure then some of the complications of that and finally going to holocopolis and life cycles so to start at the beginning it should actually be with coccolithus pelagicus not amelia only huxley in this case it's coccolithus pelagicus it's a common species in the North Atlantic, up in really temperate, temperate and colder latitudes. And it's, it's a relatively large coccolith of the four, and it is the original, it was the very first species to be described. It's where, and this is why it's called coccolithus, and it's sorry, it's the type coccolith. It also, interestingly enough, was the very first species on which anyone ever studied how coccoliths form. Uh, this guy, Dick, so Dixon, in 1900, looking in light microscope at coccolith pelagicus cells, then, then saw, you could see inside the cell, coccolith forming. And he deduced then the coccolith were formed inside the cell and, they, and then formed the, and then were shoved out to form the composite coccosphere. Which is indeed what happens. Um, on, these, on these images here we have, here's a typical picture. And actually it's not that easy to see them inside. You have to really focus through carefully. But one thing you can do is decalcify the cells it's just bubble carbon dioxide through a, through a culture medium, then the coccoliths are dissolved. And actually, it shows one of the curious side effects that basically coccoliths, although they're a really important part of coccolith, coccoliths in terms of morphology and they, the cell is highly adapted to form them, they aren't actually essential. They don't, they don't form a, a physiological function. So it's, it was a reflection of why, one, one of the reasons why I'm going first, they probably are actually predominantly protect, protective in function. Anyway, you can decalcify them, and then, then you can, here you can see the cells inside, coccoliths inside the cell. It's a remarkable piece of work by Alison Taylor and colleagues, which is in a paper 2007, and they have this beautiful video, which I will show you now which is again, it's, it's on the INA website and it's actually, again, it's really easy to find on the web if you want to. If you just search for coccolith formation video and you'll find it easily on YouTube. We you have you can run this video now, which just is, which is basically, it's an, it's an eight hour, it's a time lapse of looking at coccolith pelagicus cells over an eight hour time period where the cells were initially decalcified. So then, so here's a, from these decalcified cells, which then it just formed one coccolith and now you can see another coccolith forming inside the cell getting bigger, I can you say it almost fills the entire cell in back to this stage, must be uncomfortable. And then it gets, gets pushed out of the outside and another coccolith starts forming. You can see how it starts off as much smaller and again it slowly, it grows, grows and eventually it will be pushed out. Exocyto is the technical term for that. And here we see a fourth one just starting to form. That's it. So it's, so it's making about one coccolith every two hours in that sequence. We will progress on. And remarkable process, even just look at it like that. You see how they form, so coccolith forming inside the cell, then being pushed out. It's quite unusual way of, of doing the bioanalysis. It's quite cool in terms of the, well, of the, final skeletal morphology because it produces this cell which, which is really strong when it's crushed, when it's, when it's pushed together, but on the other hand it can grow and get bigger and like quite a lot of types of exoskeleton where it essentially is a rigid exoskeleton in order for the organism to get any larger it needs to make a complete new shell. For the coccoliths it's quite a cool structure because basically they can add extra components at any time and make the cell bigger and bigger without having to throw away the old ones. And indeed when the cell divides then the daughter cells each, each keep part of the coccoliths 
and so they actually recycle them. And the coccolith, in principle, could actually be much older than the cell. However, the cool part, in terms of how those coccoliths are forming, they basically, it's a two-phase process. First, they nucleate. The, the, the initial phase of, of calcite nucleation, which is just a very simple little, little rhombohedral crystal form. You can see them here. And this is in Emiliani and Huxley in, as, a, as a sketch section, and then these are the transmission electron micrographs in th thin sections showing it forming, uh, then getting larger. And that was one way in which they've been studied by looking at, at thin sections like this across cells. You can also, if you take a, if you take a culture of cells, with, then you'll end up with having coccolites at different stages of, of formation, in, 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 intracellular coccolites at different stages of growth, and you can basically then just make, compare them, which is what we did here in the paper in 91 where we've basically got Emiliani and Huxley again, and then here are the coccolis at different stages of growth. And you can see them going again from simple, very simple initial nucleation of crystals, call this a protococcolith ring, then the crystals growing in different directions to form the final form. And you can see it again shown in these diagrams, which are just which are based on a combination of these sorts of observations and SEM observations trying that. So it's, it's one of the advantages of getting a growth sequence. So you can really start working out how the structure works and you can see very rapid that start off as very simple crystals, but then as they grow, they start kinking and, and, and overlapping with each other. And so the structure actually locks together. And one consequence of that is not only does the nucleation phase determine exactly the number of crystals in the final coccolith, there's no, new, no subsequent nucleation, but also it determines the crystallographic orientation because they don't rotate or change orientation afterwards. Basically they're nucleated in one orientation and that orientation will stay as they grow and get larger. And you can see, in this case, they're growing in. So you've got the initial crystals forming, and they grow, they grow inwards to form the grill, oops, going back, upwards, and then over to form the distal shield, and outwards to form the distal, to form the proximal shield. And they're also then, in the case of Emiliani Huxley, they're actually growing a second. So they're forming, the, the tube around the central area grows in two different directions, one growing that way, and one growing up, in, some inside growing in, in this direction, which then makes which actually helps lock the whole structure together, which is quite typical. When you look at the, stru the coccolith structures, it's often there's quite a lot of modification of the form in order to make a rigid structure. And then, the, as I said, the, it, the, that structure then determines crystallography. Each of these elements, we've drawn two of them here, but each of these crystal units is one crystal, which is then formed of, which formed of various different parts, which we call elements. And they all have, and, and the crystallographic orientation in this case is going along the length of the elements and along the length of that ring. Oops. And that then gives you a radial array of calcite crystal, crystal and a radial array, so it gives you the radial extinction cross, which probably most of you are quite familiar with. Very typical of coccolith of course, for this sort of bright extinction cross. Okay, so that's the base, that's in Emiliani and also in coccolithus. The same process has been going on forming heterococcolis, these ones with the complex radial subsymmetry, right back through geological time. Here we're going back down to the late Jurassic, one of my favorite parts of Britain on Dorset, where we have these, this Kimbridge Bay in the upper Jurassic, where we have these pale, it's, it's a thick, thick shale sequence, actually dinoflagellate dimension, has these pale limestones, which are laminated coccolith limestones, preserving blooms of coccolith. Actually, the lamination goes down to sort of micron scale, and they're probably actually annual laminations. And um, if you look at it, look at a broken surface, it's more or less a monospecific assemblage of what's in our area. But if you look at the assemblage, you say, well, it's, okay, it's, uh, it's a little bit of diversity in there. You can see the coccospheres, see loose coccoliths, then we can also start seeing coccoliths at intermediate growth phases. Oh, as soon as one, coming from the perspective of knowing how Emiliania forms in coccoliths, you see immediately that's similar to what we saw with, with Emiliania huxleyi. And then if, in fact, if one goes, if you look further, you can start find you can find coccospheres like this one, which is what really confirmed it for us that we were looking at a growth sequence where we have here a coccosphere broken open, and inside it we can see one of those coccoliths in a, a, an immature coccolith, so which is still growing or was was still growing 190 million years ago before the poor thing died, and so the poor thing got known this. It's stuck inside that, but it is you know, it, it, it's it's a fossil record of, of the actual of the growth process. And so again, we can make a sequence from that, from the coccolith at different stages, work out the structure in a similar way to Emiliania Huxley. It's not so different at first glance to E. Huxley. We've got growth again in various different directions to form the final radial array. But in this, the difference here is that we have 
most of the copolith is formed of one set of units, but there's also a second cycle, which you can see on, around here, of additional crystal units, which don't inter interjoin with those. In fact, if we look at it on, turn it upside down, here's that diagram again, this is looking at from underneath, the proximal, we'll look at the proximal shield, and you actually see that around this area, that we have two different crystal unit types, the ones which form the pegs, so if we extend down to the bottom, and we have the two are alternating. Well, that's here's again, it's a slightly dissolved specimen. Here's a non dissolved specimen. And so we have the, the, what we term the R units forming most of the coccolith, and then V units forming these little peg like structures, which then grow up to form that. And we call them V and R because that reflects the crystallographic orientation. So the R units have radial C axes and produce a nice bright, bright pseudo extinction crossing. In, when we sit, look at them in plan view. The V units have vertical C axes, and so they appear dark in, in cross polars. If you're not good on cross polars and understanding what I'm meaning in those, it's really worth again reading those up. And Mario Pichau has made some really nice videos on understanding crystallography and, and what you see in a, in a polarizing light microscope. Um, again, there's links to those from the web on the INA web page and other places, and I certainly recommend those to any student to have a look at those. If you, know, if, you have, if you have any doubts about how these images work and how you interpret what you see down the light microscope in terms of the structure which we see in SEM, then it's well worth looking at those videos. So anyway, v, v, R. So we have these two subparts, vertical, so V units, R units, vertical and radial, and they, two, and they alternate around the protococulus ring, and that pattern Pretty cool. We first found in Watson area very rapidly. Then we started thinking this actually would be a key for us. We look, we look at other coccolith structures, then find plenty, lots more examples. So here's another simple example from the Mesozoic by Scutum, which has well, Scutum magnum, is a nice big ones. So it's easy to see it on it. But basically, the, the distal shield is formed in this case formed of the V units, and so dark proximal shield and most of the central structure is formed of R units, and so forms a bright ring. So you can see it bright in the centre, and you can just about see, if you focus up and down, you'll be able to see that, that, there's a, that the proximal shield is bright, and the two alternate. Um, Chalcidiscus is a Cenozoic one, which forms a similar, similar sort of pattern, with distal shield formed of V units, proximal shield formed of R units, and here, you can, here this is four images of the same coccolith. You can see in phase contrast, the V unit is, 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 is appearing dark, and it's, a, it's that whole, the whole distal shield, Whereas in cross polarized light, all we can see is the proximal shield, which is substantially smaller and it's only and it's strongly biorefringent. And then, actually, for understanding all the image, then this sort of sketch inside view is a quick and quick way to summarize the structure. And again, it's and actually in terms of making a quick mental model for understanding what the structure is and comparing them, then these simple side view drawings are really useful. And so we're showing then that then. The V unit, which is dark in, in plan view, is shown dark shading, and the R unit shown bright shading. And the circle here shows where the protococcolith ring initial nucleation was. And that's one complication in Chalcidiscus, and actually in quite a few modern coccolith cores, is that the protococcolith ring ends up getting buried inside the structure. There's growth downwards from it, and so you can only see it just in here. As opposed to actually in most Mesozoic ones, then, then if you turn them upside down, we can see the VR, you can see the, see the alternating zone where the VR, VR units alternated, which is where the protocol ring is immediately visible on the proximal surface. I guess whenever I tap it, advances. So here, so it's there, also in VR in Fribospirella, Prediscospira, Iphalithus, very different coccolith structures, but all showing the orig or, origin, origination by a, from nucleation here of then of, of units we alternate V and R. And so that basically ends up being a common pattern shown across heterococcolith biodiversity. And that was what got us the nice nature paper back in 92, where basically showing that we had this common pattern of biomineralization, which of the nucleation of these alternating vertical and radial units has been has stayed there throughout the evolution of coccoliths, even though they've grown in different ways. And so it's a, it was a pretty cool thing was showing how the biomineralization method in this, this sense is fixed as opposed to then how it's expressed gets varied between species and, and, and between families. Uh, so that's why in terms of biomineralization, it's an interesting process. It also, of course, then for the uh, coccolith workers for, for you know, practical, practical 
taxonomy, it provides a really good key to understanding to, for the basis of their classification. Um, and actually, we had used the, the appearance of coccoliths in cross-polarized light and their basic structure as the basis for coccolith taxonomy way before we understood how that related to the biomineralization. But then, and that was basically when we look at it, it has this cool thing, not only is the biomineralization really distinctive and it defines the families, but also it's what we see in the light microscope. So it's, uh, biomineralization is often a really good, th good tool for understanding the morph the phylogeny of organisms, but in the case of coccoliths, we have the added bonus that this is exactly what we see when we look in cross-polarized light at them. We see the pattern we see in light reflects the biomineralization, which is the most fundamental aspect of their morphology. And so even things which can be quite morphologically different end up sh showing much more obvious similarities in cross-polarized light, which is why, so then, so because our taxonomy was based on that, then actually it worked very well, the taxonomy. Um, so it's still, still, so now, and if, okay, to show that then, so our, so when we came to do molecular genetics on coccolithophores, then unlike many groups of protists, the, the classical taxonomy mapped really well onto molecular, onto the molecular trees, because our classical taxonomy, our, our family level groupings were all based primarily on coccolith structure as seen in, and particularly that the structure as seen in cross-polarized light. And so, yeah, that's just showing basically the colored. This is, this is an early molecular tree back 2004. It's got more complicated since there's more tax are added, but the pattern hasn't changed. And basically the colored boxes here are families. And you can see that all the families basically form nice groups within the taxonomic tree. Amelia. The, Emiliani Huxley actually ends up being a bit of an aberration now because it's, the, because it's only formed of R units as opposed to all these other ones formed of both V and R units. But if we go back to the very earlier stage, and this was back right back in the 91 paper, then if you go back to the protocol of the ring, here's all the, these big units are what ends up going to form the main crystal units. And then in between them, tiny little crystal units, which actually don't, don't grow at all. It, when you get to the final coccolith structure, we just basically can't see them. I've got, I've got them drawn in as a little gray box here, but that's almost like imagination here. I was sort of predicting they should still be there buried in, we can't see them. Or actually what you do see some is just little slits where they, where they would have been. So we inferred that these were V units at the time. 1991, there was no way to actually prove that. Subsequently, the actual technology for doing electron diffraction in, in TEM has improved. And a few years ago, in a German team led by Ramona Hoffman, or the student who did the work, uh, did, did applied really high resolution TEM electron diffraction to Emiliani Huxleyi and actually proved that way that there really was a V unit in there, which is quite nice when she went and we proved the prediction. Um, also, an Emiliani Huxley, another thing to remember, okay, so we call them V units and R units, but it's sort of a, it's a shorthand that, when I say V vertical, it's more or less vertical, when I say R radial, it's more or less radial, rather than being absolutely radial, and in fact, the, the R units particularly, they're not, they're actually more oblique than radial, you can see them here, so the C axis is going along the hammer handle, and along this direction, actually along the, along the length of the central, the, uh, the lats in the central area as well. And if you look on this image, you can, where it's, been, it's nicely slightly etched, and you can begin to see that that direction, which is, this is where the R unit is, is so this is where the CX is going along this direction, and it's not radial, it's consistently rotated slightly anti-clockwise. So you've got a handedness to the structure, a chirality. Chirality, chirality actually means hand, so basically it's a non-superimposable mirror image. You've got a, you, that, if you look at any coccolith, they, you can see aspects of that, of, of any heterococcolith, you'll see aspects of that morphology which are going clockwise or anti-clockwise. So here's a umbilicus fibra seba guy showing that, sorry, umbilicus fibra foliosa, and you can see that these, the, the, this curvature in the sutures is going this, going this way. And, every, and if you look, every single one of these coccoliths is going the same way, and that's consistent. If you take any coccolith, then they all show the same chirality. Well, ev every coccolith of a given species will show the same handedness. So if we go back to Emiliani Huxley, I have tested this to destruction. I've looked at, probably checked it on like thousands of images of Emiliani Huxley. I, there's lots of different ways you can see the chirality like this, this structure. And every, or actually even, even going down to the, the, the little, sh these little 
shapes of, 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 the, of the crystal endings, and they all go the same way. And you'll never find you'll never find a an, a left you know, if you call that a left-handed form, you'll never find a right-handed form of Emiliani Huxley. You'll never find an umbilicus fibra foliosa where it's where the curvature is going anti-clockwise instead of clockwise. If you do, I'll be very. If you do, I will give you a prize or something. But <laughs> but, um, but it's a confident prediction you won't. Um, we've, let's say, we've looked at lots and lots of specimens that ever find it. That also gives a clue to why to where that chirality comes from. In some organisms like snails, you have. And a, you, you remember that gastropods. The vast majority of gastropods will curve one way. But you get an occasional one which goes the other way. Um, same with foraminifera. You get that they all. Foraminifera typically, a couple species will coil in, coil one way, but then maybe one percent will coil the opposite direction, or maybe in some species even 50-50. And that's because the morphology there is developing by cells adding on. And so basically, a, 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 well, not cells, sorry, by chain, chambers being added, and it's a sort of super molecular process, a fairly large scale process in the coccoliths. Then the completely consistent chirality suggests it's actually being controlled at the molecular level. Because when you go to the molecular level, then basically all molecules are chiral, all, all, all the large molecules are. So DNA is, in, is, in, is chiral, every single DNA spiral, every single DNA molecule spirals the same way, otherwise this wouldn't work. And so then the proteins which are coded by DNA, the whole, when proteins are formed, again, it's a chiral structure, and every single protein goes the same way. And so in consequence, anything, when you go down to the real cellular, when you go down to the bottom of biochemistry, then everything is chiral. And, and then, so if you have consistent chirality, it's an indication it's basically being controlled at the molecular level. And so that then leads to prediction that probably what's controlling the nucleation is some kind of molecular template. So in some ways, so basic idea, we have some kind of, of macromolecule which has binding sites which mirror the binding sites on a calcite on a calcite in, in calcite. So you've got mirror the, the ionic array in calcite. And so actually, you know, so Man and Sparks 88 was suggesting there was some kind of template which accounted for the fact that all the Emiliani Huxley crystals were perfectly arranged, perfectly aligned, completely controlled it's in terms of both their C axis, which is the optic axis, but also the A axis. So it's, a, it's a completely aligned crystals. Extended that a bit further, we suggested back in the 92 paper that maybe there was some kind of folded template which then could produce alternating vertical and radial rays. And Mary Marsh subsequently made a sort of slightly simpler, but less, in some ways less elegant way of folding them in order to get the same kind of effect. Still think that's probably true in this case. We've had the predictions been lying around for 20 odd, no, no, 30 odd years now. And, and, it hasn't, and we haven't actually managed to identify and find the protein yet and, and find out how that templating goes. But we still, still seems reasonable to think there's some kind of molecular template. Okay, on to some complex, complications of the model. Um, first one, central areas. The simplest pattern is, to, is for the central, so okay, we have the rim and the central area. Essentially, the rim is what's formed by growing outwards from the protococcolith ring, and the central area is what's formed by growing inwards. And in some cases, it's the central area is just formed of the same elements. So in Emiliani, Huxley, and other reticulae fenestrids, the, the grill in the centre is just formed of the same units growing, in, growing radially inwards. And even the bridge, the yeah, Angiophyra capsa, is just formed by the same units. There's no new nucleation. Just some of some of the ones of the inner tube just arch over and form the bridge, and so you can see how you can actually get quite different morphologies just by allowing the growth. Of, you've got the same exactly the same basic bionization pattern, but just allowing it to grow in different ways. You can make what sort of species and genetic level sort of differences. So good thing. again, of course, in the media, in some of them we get slits as well. Um, that's a more simple one. Other ones, though, start being a bit, being a bit different. It's they don't form entirely by the simple. So in coccolithus, we've got, this is an early growth phase of coccolithus, just to show the structure. This, this will end up turning into a big coccolithus um, by the shields growing outwards. But the, across the central area, we have the, the bridge forming here. And you can see here that the bridge is formed of separate little rhombohedral crystals. So in this case, the central structure is formed by additional nucleation. But, they, but it's sort of like VR nucleation. Quite often, when you look at those sorts of central structures, and quite a lot of Mesozoic ones show this, you actually see alternating 
crystallographic, alternating, two, two types of crystals alternating go along that central structure. So that's sort of a mod. So essentially, I see this as being, it's like it's VR nucleation, but we've got one belt of VR nucleation around the rim and a second one going across the center. Then you can have something significantly different, which is what happens in, say, Rabspiracy, where they basically got VR mode in the, in the rim, but in the central area, they're just doing something totally different. And we don't actually, this is an aspect, again, which we just don't understand. We don't know quite what's happening here. But it is, can be amazingly cool. There are some quite phenomenal structures. And, it, and they also, I mean, not only are they phenomenally complicated and beautiful, but they're also just like each one seems to be different. Each genus they to go and reinvent how the central area structure. So here's Rabdospira, these phenomenal, this be, quite awesome structure. We've basically got five spiraling sets of, of rhombohedra. And each one of these is a separately nucleated calcite crystal, but they end up with this five pointed star and then a little pimple on the end. Um, then discus fire again, really beautiful structure. Um, yeah, there's a really nice image on the Nano Talks poster, which hopefully you see, showing it how we've got this, this very cool tube, uh, sort of funnel structure, which is, but that's being formed by a completely different pressure. You've got the, it's just the rib, just the outer part of the room, which is formed of the VR. The rest is a different structure, and it's, it's still forming inside the cell, though, which is what you can see nicely on this image where the, this, this trumpet here is still inside the coccosphere. And so the trumpet and the base are both formed inside the coccosphere. And, and it sort of almost looks in this case like it's too big to go inside the coccosphere. And part of the reason is actually in Discospira, they seem to form the trumpet and the base separately, and they're only joined together once it's exocytosed. And no, we don't fully understand how that happens. There's, uh, when, when you get through into the complication, there's still lots that we don't understand. Okay. Second complication on VR is that that model only applies to heterococcoliths, the ones with rims with, with complicated crystals. There's a whole separate, separate group of, co of coccoliths called holococcoliths, which are formed not of, which are formed just of a mass of minute little rhombohedral crystals. Each, each individual crystal here is just what is, each of these little rhombohedra is a separate crystal. The crystals have very simple morphology, uh, just, just rhombohedra, like a simple calcite rhombohedra, just like you get if you from growing calcite inorganically, but they're all the same size and then they're beautifully arranged in, t in tiers and structures and, 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 and nice sheets, sheet-like arrays to make the final coccolith morphology. And it's a very different biomineralization process. And quite logically, when people first realized we've got these two different types of coccoliths, holococcoliths, heterococcoliths, they were it was assumed that they were just different families of coccoliths, taxonomically different groups. Then in 1960, Park and Adams, back in, in Plymouth, biologists in Plymouth, had a cu culture of Coccolithus pelagicus, this form of Coccolithus pelagicus, and then it suddenly started changing to forming this sort of cell with much thin, with much more delicate Coccolithus, as you can see in light microscope, it's forming a very thin layer around the outside. Then when they looked at that in the transmission electron microscope, they found it was producing a completely different type of, it was actually producing holococcoliths. And they were able to, get to, to do this repeatedly, so they absolutely, absolutely knew this. Definitely, it, was, it wasn't any contamination. It's the same, same organism basically can undergo a change in its life cycle and produce a different type of cell. In this case, it also swims. You can see, see here the flagelli have a motile phase of the life cycle, which produces a holococcolis as opposed to a non-motile form, which forms heterococcolis. And, now, and then actually, if you go out to the Arctic particularly, you could, you'll often, reasonably often, find coccospheres like this, where we've got heterococcolith forming phase, which is at, but covered also with holococcoliths. So what's happened is you've had a life cycle change and it's now, it's gone from the, from the phase which produces holococcoliths to the phase of producing heterococcoliths. And we call these combination coccospheres. And, now, and occasionally you find them in, in Coccolithus pelagicus gardens are reasonably common. There's a few other kinds of common. Other, other ones, have, they occur much more sparsely, but by observing these, which was started by Louisa Cross back around 2000, really started highlighting the value of these for working out life cycle, life cycle associations. And here's, here's a lovely example of first from Helicospira, Helicospira carteri, the heterococcolith phase, which, which forms these amazing spiral structures. And again, every single one of these always goes the same way. And then, the, and then you occasionally find these combination coccospheres, which show that the alternate life cycle phase is this type of holococcolith. And the cartoon here is, is showing the idea that you have two holococcoliths, 
which have a haploid cell with only half the only one set of chromosomes will then fuse to produce a new compound cell, and that and that new cell will then produce start producing holo, the heterocopolis and eventually and then end up as this sort of cell. And that's a nice example where you've got multiple images. Here's a, but then basically we start finding occasional examples in lots of in other species. Here's a Syracus fibre. Um, and yeah, as we be, there was a phase of these back to the early 2000s, but they're still, they're still periodically we find another example of it. And it's slow, slowly been building up our knowledge of how the two could tie together. But we also, okay, that, that thing of, of how it works, the life cycle. Uh, there's a few of them where we've got them in culture and we can make, and we've got both phases in culture and having got, when they have got that, they, they don't, they will very occasionally change, but most of the time they just, just have, you just have a culture which have forms only one type of cell. And then what you can do is, is measure the amount of DNA inside the cells. And what we find is that basically there's double the DNA in the heterococcalith phases have double the DNA of the holococcalist phases. So this is the haploid phase with one set of chromosomes, as opposed to the diploid phase with two sets of chromosomes. That's the summary diagram. Diploid phase, producing the heterococcalist, and it will carry on growing asexually happily for, for, in the case of something like the calcidiscus, years and years in culture. And then until for some reason it changes and it then it undergoes meiosis, Produces the, ha the haploid cells, which again will then, which, uh, which produce the holococcalus, and again they will produce a reproduce asexually for ages. So you've got two separate stages of the life cycle, and then just occasionally we find the, the combination, co the transitional coccosphere. So, in terms of ecology and things, this is a really important aspect. It's also, in terms of the biomineralization, it's something quite extraordinary. This, where for some reason. We've got calcification occurs in both phases of life cycles, but with different mechanisms. And those two methods have, sta have stayed stable through the evolutionary history of the coccolithophores. And that's something we really don't understand. This actually makes a really interesting system in terms of genomics as well, because you start trying to see what genes are expressed in the different phases and make use it as another way of trying to understand how the bioanalyzation works. And Okay, the holocoplis, we really don't understand the biomineralization. And one, one thing about holocoplis one is the biomineralization is, is much more flexible and anarchic than it is in the holocoplis. So at species level, the morphologies are really defined and you sort of can define genera of holocoplis, but they don't tell us the large scale classification, anything like, unlike, unlike heterocoplis, where we can really what we can predict phylogenetic relationships from if they've got similar similar coccolith, coccolith ultra structure and vr pattern and we can predict they're, they're related in the holococcus it just doesn't work okay final complication which i thought i should throw in this version of the talk is nanoliths so we've got holococcus we've got heterococcus both of which are produced by coccolis pelagicus both of which are coccolis which you know we sort of define coccolis as being Things which defy, which, which are produced in a homologous way to the, the coccolis formed by coccolis pelagicus, since that's the original one. But then nanoliths are ones which don't show, which show the same sort of set that they're, they're the set there, again, calcareous nanopossils, the same size as coccoliths, uh, and showing very comp and showing complex regular structures, but right down to crystal level, but they don't show either V mode or R mode calcification, either VR mode calcification or, or holococcalus calcification. So they don't fit either pattern. And so then there's three possibilities basically for nanoliths. One possibility is that they're just heterococcalus which have got different and lost that, so the VR structure is no longer obvious in them. The other one is they might be holococcalus, where the holococcalus structure is no longer obvious, or there may be something completely different. And almost certainly within an analyst, there's examples of all three. Um, so, okay, Flores fire profunda is something we call an analyst because it's basically just a single big calcite crystal. That, the whole, whole coccolith is basically just one crystal unit. But in fact, if you look at the bottom of them, if they're really nicely preserved, we find they've got tiny little crystals. So basically what's happened is it's a not regular heterococcalus, which is what decided it wants to turn into a completely different shape, and it's, and it's evolved that by basically just taking one unit of, of, the, of, of the rim, it's where it's a, the black axis going that way, it's actually a V unit, although it falls over, so it's having biorefringent, and it's basically just, as I've taken one element, and it's grown up in, it's into a completely different shape, so it's enough, no, you'd never, 
it's another example about how we have sort of typical sort of way evolution works. If you're going to design a coccolith from scratch, you'd never you're going to design an, a Florispira nanolith from scratch. You'd never bother with the holococcus at the bottom because it's evolved from, from a heterococcolith. It still has the, it's attached to the bottom. So this case, Profunda is most definitely it's a it's a modified heterococcolith. And there's quite a few other examples back, back in the fossil record, particularly where we know that's the case. Um, so, for instance, yeah, yeah this Raphidites is long rod-shaped thing, but we find tiny little basal coccoliths on them. And there's, there's quite a few cases where nanoliths essentially are just modified heterococcoliths. Other cases, they definitely aren't. So, Ceratolithus, we know from the life cycle, sorry about the slightly garish colours on this one, but Ceratolithus does that Ceratolithus has two phase in life cycle. One, one, one phase produces heterococcolis, the other phase produces the Ceratolis, which definitely aren't heterococcolis, and they, it's a reasonable prediction, they probably are produced in a haploid phase. Well, there's a bit of a complication. They also have these hoop, hoop coccolis, which are produced in the, so it's, we're a bit unsure about exactly how the, hetero, how the haploid diploid phase works, but they're not just modified heterococcolis, because these are the heter, heterococcolis we can see on the outside, that's heterococcolis. These form, the, 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 the nanoliths, Whatever they are, they're not modified heterococcolis. And really, it's hard to see them as being in, in any way a heterococcolis. And also, when you have a cell, it's the, the actual cell is, is, is much is, is, is smaller. So in some ways, it, it looks like they're being formed outside the coccolis. Um, another example where we know it's not, not it's, it's actually neither modified heterococcolis. I mean, it's conceivable in some way that could be, you could describe as a modified, it might, it might have evolved in some way from a holococcolis phase. Polycrator is another one. Polycrator, You'll only come across these if you work on modern plankton. They're really small. It's only about 0.2 of a micron across, little little square cups. And, th and these, these are made of aragonite, not calcite, which is one clue that they're not homologous. And then the alternate life cycle phase, we know again from the work of Louisa Crosses, that they, they, they form, they, they, their alternate life cycle phase is, a, is Alice Fibre, which is a completely normal heterocopolis. No, I give him a picture of it. But basically, it's, it's a perfectly regular heterococcolis, and then and the alternate life cycle phase is an aragonitic thing, which looks sort of like a heterococcolis. But it tends to look like a holococcolis. So again, it just seems like this is a. It, it's, it's not a modified heter holococcolis in any way. That it's yeah, they're, they're weird things. So it looks like in this case we've got a complete, another totally separate biomineralization mode. So then, it's totally reasonable, we'll still call them nanoliths as being. Uh, not holococcolis, not heterococcolis, they're something else, even though they're being formed by the same taxonomic, uh, they're still being formed by coccolithophores. And another example on the same lines, Veruda spira, everybody, you know, one, of, one of our favourite species, Veruda spira bigelowi, produces these beautiful pentagonal coccoliths, pentagonal nanoliths, which then form a nice, do, wrong, I mean, nice do, dodecahedral sphere. And we know from beautiful work, particularly by Kyoko Hagino, that they're quite, that, that they are, um, they're definitely not heterococcolis. On the one hand, so we know the alternate life cycle phase in this case is a, hap, is a haptophyte, which non-calcifies. The calcification occurs on the, around the outside of the coccolis, not in, they aren't formed inside the cell and exocytose. <coughs> in terms of the biomineralization, bio they're very different, they've got Tangential calcite C axes rather than radial, and then the, the individual they form these and the individual these five units each behave as a single crystal unit with a tangential C axis. But then if we look at them in side views, they've got this laminar substructure to them. They form fine little laminae, and they sort of seem to grow by stacking up. I mean, so they're growing in a very different way to either heterococcolis or holococcolis. So again. That's a different biomineralization mode, which seems to have evolved separately. So it sort of begins to look like, in some way, within the haptophytes, we've got a group. Oh, okay. And then the molecular genetics basically, here's all the holococcoliths, here's all the coccolithophore clade, and then the Brutus fibre on this is, is plotting really basal in the tree. In this tree, it looks like they're forming inside the, holoco inside the coccolithophore clade, in other ones, they fall just outside it. But very broadly, the pattern we see is we've got cal calcification occurs distinctively in the, in the haptophytes, and it's always within actually one sub part of the haptophytes, which is what we've now, uh, what name we've given if this is, cal is the calci haptophytes, the, the haptophytes which have the ability to calcify. Some way they evolved the ability to calcify, but then it's been expressed in different ways, both 
to a certain extent within different groups like Rudis Myra versus the rest of the copulative force. And then also expressed differently in different life cycles. So we have it expressed differently in the, in the haploid and the diploid phase. So, that just about fit. Uh, thank you for listening. And to summarise, coccolith calcification is a very, very controlled process. It's a really fundamental aspect of the... Of the it's, but calcification is not easy to do, both because you've got to modify the cell biology quite a lot in order to control, to, to actually get components into the cell and then to regulate it, but also because calcite itself is, because it's, is a very anisotropic substance. So, so to, to shape calcite into, really, into, into a coccolith takes really a lot of biological control. So it's a very controlled process, and in, con and it, and in consequence of that, patterns of viralization make very good taxonomic characters. And so it's really useful for, so it's a, it's a fundamental basis to understanding the taxonomy and, 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 and recognizing how we classify coccoliths. So yeah, crystal orientation are really useful characters. And just to recap, the two, the main bioanalyzation modes are heterococcoliths with their rate, start off with radial arrays of VNR units, polycoccoliths with minute rhombohedral crystallites. And then we have nanoliths, which have variable origins. So, hope you found that interesting. And as we, as I mentioned in the talk, if you want to understand more about the crystallography and, and how, how in practice you, do, you start looking look at the morphology, I do recommend Mario Cachao's Crystals for Nanos at Movies. Thank you.